Welcome to everyone. I'm James Jensen, today's webinar chair. I'm a contractor supporting the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs Tribal Energy Webinar Series. Today's webinar, titled Tribal Microgrids, Energy Storage and Resilience, is the final webinar of the 2019 DOE, DOE Tribal Energy Webinar Series. Let's quickly go over some event details. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on DOE's Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs website. It will be available in about one week. Copies of today's PowerPoint presentation will be posted to the web shortly after this webinar. They may actually already be posted or will be posted very shortly. So um, if you're really excited to get the slides, you can, you can uh, check our webpage during the webinar and, and maybe download them. Everyone will receive a post-webinar email with the link to the page where the slides and recording will be located. Because we are recording this webinar, all phones have been muted. We will answer your written questions at the end of the final presentation. You can submit a question at any time by clicking on the question button located in the webinar control box on your screen and typing your question. Let's get started with opening remarks from Lozana Pierce. Ms. Pierce is a senior engineer and deployment supervisor in the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs, duty stationed in Golden, Colorado. Lozana is responsible for managing technical assistance and education and outreach activities on behalf of the office, implementing national funding opportunities and administering the resultant tribal energy project grants and agreements. She has 25 years of experience in project development and management and has been assisting tribes in developing their energy resources for nearly 20 years. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in mechanical engineering from Colorado State University and pursued a master's in business administration through the University of Northern Colorado. Mazana, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, James, and hello, everyone. I join James in welcoming you to the eighth and final webinar of the 2019 series. This webinar series is sponsored by the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs, otherwise referred to for short, the Office of Indian Energy. The Office of Indian Energy directs, fosters, coordinates, and implements energy planning, education, management, and programs that assist tribes with energy development, capacity building, energy infrastructure, energy costs, and electrification of Indian lands and homes. To provide this assistance, the deployment program works within the Department of Energy, across government agencies, and with Indian tribes and organizations to help those Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages overcome the barriers to energy development. Our deployment program is composed of a three-pronged approach consisting of financial assistance, technical assistance, and education and capacity building. This Tribal Energy Webinar Series is just one example of our education and capacity building efforts. The webinar series is also part of the Office of Indian Energy's efforts to support fiscally responsible energy business and economic development decision making and information sharing amongst tribes. It is intended to provide attendees with information on the tools and resources to develop and implement tribal energy plans, programs, and projects. It will also highlight tribal energy case studies and identify business strategies tribes can use to expand their energy options and develop sustainable local economies. Today's webinar will focus on microgrids and why and how tribes are using them. In recent years, tribes have shown increased interest in microgrids. Among the reasons for this interest is the potential for microgrids to help tribal communities improve resilience, use local energy resources, and control energy costs. However, the potential benefits of microgrids are hardly dependent on the variables of each specific situation. In this webinar, hopefully will help provide attendees with information that can assist tribal governments and project leaders in identifying microgrid opportunities suited to your unique situations. We do hope this webinar and webinar series is useful to you, um, so we also welcome your feedback. So please let us know if there are ways we can make the series better. We are now planning uh, the 2020 webinar series, so, so if you do have comments, uh, let us know so we can uh, consider those in our 2020 planning. And with that, I'll turn the virtual floor back over to James. James. Thank you, Lozana. Before we get to the presentations, I will introduce all of today's presenters. Our first present for our first presentation, we will hear from Robert Wood. Bob is an electrical engineer at NREL in the Applied Engineering Team, focused on microgrid projects 
incorporating renewable energy generators, energy storage, and controls. He has been at NREL for about a year and has worked on microgrids and controls for 14 years. Prior to uh, working at NREL, Bob worked at IPERC, a subsidiary of SNC Electric, where he provided technical oversight on fixed installation and tactical microgrids. Bob also worked for the U.S. Army Research Lab on power electronics design, electrical vehicle components, and microgrid components. Following Bob, we will hear from Jana Ganyan. Jana is the Sustainability and Government Affairs Director for the Blue Lake Rancheria Tribal Government. Jana has established the tribe's stra uh, strategy for zero carbon resilience. She has led development of low carbon community scale and facility scale microgrids, electric vehicle infrastructure, and conducts strategic planning in sustainability, climate action, both mitigation and ad adaptation, emergency pre preparedness, and economic development. Jana investigates policies, programs, and invest investments to achieve rapid, cost-effective transition to decarbonized and resilient communities for the resulting social, environmental, and economic co-benefits. Following Jana, we will hear from Dave Messier. Dave works for the Rural Energy. Uh, Dave works as the Rural Energy Coordinator for the Canada Chiefs Conference as a nonprofit intertribal consortium serving the nearly 37 communities in Interior Alaska. Dave has been working on rural energy needs in Bush communities since 2009. He holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell University and an MBA from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Dave and his wife Heidi have two children and are proud to call Fairbanks home. Our final presenter will be Dan Malcolm. Dan is the planning manager for the Agua Caliente Band of Kalia Indians. He has worked for the tribe for over 13 years. His responsibilities include de developing land use, transportation, environmental management, and renewable energy plans and or feasibility studies, zoning regulations, code enforcement, and facilitating day-to-day -day coordination with federal and state agencies and local governments. Dan has a bachelor's of science degree in planning and development and a master's of planning from the University of Southern California. Thanks to each of our presenters for making the time to join us today. With that, let's get started with our first presentation. Bob, please proceed once your slides are up. Thank you for the uh, introduction, James. Um, so as he mentioned, uh, I'm from National Renewable Energy Lab. I was asked to give a little bit of background in terms of microgrids, um, kind of what they are, what are some of the components, um, and how do they function. Um, and so can you advance the next slide? So first, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of background on what a microgrid is um, on a fairly high level before diving into some of the components. Um, so first, kind of start with a definition. It's basically a group of loads and sources in a discrete uh, electrical area. Um, it can be connected to the grid, the wider grid, and it can run in an islanded mode as well. Um, some microgrids are kind of never connected to the grid, um, either because they're on an island or they're in a very remote location where there isn't a connection to a larger grid. There's two primary modes of operation. It's either connected to the grid or it's not. Um, any remote facility is always operating in island mode, um, but any concept uh, of a system that's grid connected or not um, still applies. Uh, next slide. There's a lot of different applications that you can use microgrids for. It depends kind of on the orientation of the equipment, uh, the buildings, um, and kind of what the desires of what you want the microgrid to do. Um, it's used a lot uh, in commercial or in the industrial areas where the focus is how do we uh, reduce our costs um, but also provide backup power in emergency situations. We see this a lot as well with community or city or utilities um, wanting to improve their reliability or to meet energy and emission targets. Facilities are another place uh, that we see a lot of growth in microgrids. Um, a good example is Department of Defense, um, where they're looking at uh, a base and how do we provide 
emergency power to some of these facilities uh, if the grid does have equipment. And then the last kind of piece of microgrids is uh, rural, rural communities, as I kind of mentioned before. Um, this includes um, islanded communities. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, in the Caribbean and other areas, and also fairly remote places uh, like Alaska. Next slide. So why do we, why, why, why all this focus on microgrids? Um, there's several benefits. Um, the first is reliability. Um, it's providing a backup power system for the grid when a grid goes out. It allows you to incorporate more fuel sources. So instead of just saying, oh, when the power goes out, we'll fire up a backup generator, you can add components like uh, energy storage unit, you can add uh, renewables um, and a lot of other pieces to help manage uh, fuel sources, especially in a long uh, outage. There's a lot of economic reasons uh, that people are moving toward microgrids. They can provide grid tied services. So things like uh, peak shaving, uh, voltage and frequency stabilization, uh, those kinds of things, and there are certain utilities that will pay to have those services. You can increase your energy production quite a bit uh, and also tie in some energy efficient measures. Other components um, that are reasons that people go down the path of microgrids are improved power quality, um, combined heat and power integration. So a generator that generates both heat and power can be integrated um, very well with microgrids. Uh, and then also for electrification. So allowing uh, the microgrid to kind of expand the area uh, that is being covered. Next slide. So of course, with any emerging technology, there's always challenges. Um, renewables, although have uh, great potential and uh, cheap energy, um, is highly variable and requires backup sources in case it goes down. Um, it's typically a much weaker grid, and therefore, um, it's much more difficult to control. It operates in multiple different manners um, and therefore uh, the controller has to be able to do a bunch of more uh, more things than it does normally. Um, one of the things I mentioned uh, as a benefit is the increased resilience. Well, one of the issues is how do you quantify uh, numerically what, what that benefit is? If uh, you lose power you know, twice a year for an hour, what, what is that worth? to you. It's a very hard number to quantify uh, and that's one of the challenges with microgrids because if you can quantify that really well it helps justify spending money on the microgrid. And then the last kind of challenges uh, are kind of regulatory. Um, there's a lot of interactions with the utility, there's a lot of uh, operational modes um, and sometimes very high penetrations of renewables and Therefore, there's a lot of kind of back and forth of utility to make sure that we're figuring out kind of how all these systems work together and make sure the utility is on board with these. Next slide. All right, so the next kind of section of my uh, talk is about designing the microgrid. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I wanted to kind of show what, how you kind of design the microgrid um, and there's kind of three pieces that kind of come together to help uh, researchers like myself uh, look at a location and determine what kind of microgrid makes the most sense there. First is uh, input, so looking at what is the goal? Is it resiliency? Is it cost savings? Um, looking at what is the cost of energy there, either fuel or uh, utility. Um, we have to have a good idea of what needs to be served. So what does the load look like? What is the renewable energy potential? And, and how do those kind of coincide? Um, and the next step is we kind of take all that data and pull it together in a techno-economic model, um, which basically looks at if I have an energy storage unit, it does this. If I've got PV, it does this. If I'd have wind, it does this. And it tries to figure out what is the most economic best lowest cost over the course of 20 years. Um, 
you know, PV, as an example, is very expensive up front, um, but fairly cheap to run. So therefore, it has a much different cost profile. Um, and that's kind of part of the techno-economic analysis. And the outcome of this is, is really to look at what is the mix that makes the most sense at this particular location uh, and kind of how it's going to operate. So if we go to the next slide, this gives an example of a particular site um, and some of the techno-economic and low data that we get. So on the left, to up left, uh, the graph shows um, a very typical kind of commercial load profile. And so you see kind of five higher peaks during the week, two lower peaks kind of on the weekend. Um, so that's kind of maybe a week's worth of data and I would say very typical to what the load looks like. People start turning air conditioners on during the day. They turn their computers on, those kinds of things. Uh, they reduce their power usage at night. The second piece for load data is what it looks like over the course of a year. So that's shown in the bottom left. And that's looking at what does, when does the load peak? Um, and in this particular example, like a lot of facilities, um, the load is a lot higher in the summer because uh, you have things like HVAC and other components turning on that you don't have in the winter. Um, in terms of some of the analysis, um, there's a fairly complicated graph on the right, uh, which was showing a couple different components. Um, the first is what is being pulled from the utility is the lowest graph, so it's essentially the brown color. And what this system is trying to do is manage what the system is pulling from the utility. So this particular site has uh, natural gas generators and an energy storage unit. It also has landfill gas as a renewable energy source and some PV. And what you can see is that the utility power that's being pulled from the utility is being regulated by all these sources to keep it to never go above a specific amount. Um, part of the cost of electricity for a lot of sites is uh, demand charge. So the most power that they pull, uh, they get charged for that. So if they can avoid these fairly short peaks, they can really manage their cost and make it effective to have a lot of these systems. All right, next slide. In terms of resilience, um, there are multiple layers uh, that kind of come together as part of a microgrid. The top level, of course, is the utility, and that's kind of your primary source, typically where you're pulling most of your power from. You can make it more reliable by adding multiple connection points, um, and but it will have a certain amount of downtime associated with it. Now, the microgrid is essentially one level below that, and will provide power when your utility is having issues. So if the utility goes down, the microgrid kind of takes over. There might be a short outage, and I'll describe how that works uh, in a little bit. And there, the amount of resiliency you can provide uh, is dependent on how good is your fuel sources. Um, are there renewables that are offsetting some of your fuel so you can operate a little bit longer, uh, and some other pieces. The last line of defense typically are uh, building generators or UPS systems. Those typically take over when the microgrid has uh, gone down. Um, and then in remote locations, you essentially only have kind of the bottom two layers. Um, and they're very interconnected, and it makes a very resilient system overall. OK, next slide. All right, so some of the engineering considerations that go into the design of a microgrid. For the sources, there's a lot of different components that you need to figure out. Uh, if your source of power is going to be generators, uh, you need to determine not only how many kilowatts they are, but how many of them you have. Uh, it can be sometimes more resilient to have, say, five one megawatt generators than one five megawatt generator. So there's a lot of trade-offs kind of that way. Renewables are another one. They can be kind of concentrated in one area or distributed across the grid. It has different implications. 
They have certain design lives on how long that they'll be able to provide their power. Energy storage is uh, an enabler that's becoming a lot more prevalent. Um, I've got a lot more information later about the benefits and um, complications that come with uh, energy storage, but really it's an enabler that allows a lot of uh, really neat kind of components and uh, systems to kind of work together. Um, you also have isolation devices. This really uh, sectionalizes the grid. Um, it provides backup paths sometimes. It's the way that you isolate the microgrid from the larger grid. Protection is another big piece of the engineering design. This has to do with looking at how do you protect the system in case something happens on the system, like a branch falls across the line. Um, and it's very different to protect it when it's tied to the grid versus when it's in a microgrid mode. And then the last kind of engineering component is uh, interactions with the utility. And this is where an interconnection agreement is usually comes into place uh, and figuring out what is, uh, how to meet their requirements, whether that's a minimum import or rate structure uh, change based on uh, the addition of these components. All right, next slide. So a bit of a busy slide. I um, wanted to kind of show one last consideration uh, for kind of how the system's designed. Um, this is uh, one line of an electrical system. It's a very typical way of kind of showing electrically how the components are connected, um, not only electrically, but sometimes physically as well. You typically have one, although there might be more point of com common coupling. Uh, this is essentially the link between where uh, all the load is and your utility. You also have distribution buses, which are essentially buses that are all at the same voltage um, that typically have connection devices to them. There are transformers, uh, which allow uh, buses to operate at different voltages. Um, so transmission is done typically at a much higher voltage uh, than distribution. So the voltage keeps going down as you get closer to your loads. And if you kind of look at the uh, figure on the right, um, so the point of common coupling for this particular system is kind of in the center. Um, there's a couple different distribution buses. And then um, a lot of times, uh, the, where the load is situated are called feeders. So you have multiple feeders coming out of the distribution bus and those feed typically like different sections of a facility. So you might have, um, you know, a neighborhood being fed by one feeder. So that's kind of an idea of what the one line would look like. All right, next slide. All right, I wanna go through a couple of concepts of what the microgrids, kind of how it operates um, and, a, and a few other pieces. As I mentioned before, there's two main operational modes of microgrids. They can either be grid tied or they can be islanded. Um, when you're tied to a larger grid, the grid provides voltage, it provides frequency, and it's very stable. It can absorb changes in renewables really easily. And uh, you typically have much higher fault currents, um, which I'll come back to a little bit later why that's uh, important. In island mode, the frequency is determined by your sources, um, and therefore you have to have fairly, uh, the sources that you put in a grid are the ones that are having to form the voltage and frequency for the grid. Um, the nice thing about the utility is the utility, if you're not producing enough power, they provide that extra power. When you're islanded, all the power for your grid, um, both real and reactive, have to be produced by the sources on the grid, and there's nowhere else for it to come. And that's one of the reasons why it's a little bit weaker, um, is that your sources are a lot smaller. You typically have more variations in voltage and frequency. Um, and if there is a large change in renewables, it typically has a higher impact on, on an island. Next slide. All right, so one of the uh, uh, transitions that happen is uh, 
a transition from utility connected to island and mode. So this kind of this slide shows basically there's two main ways of going from an utility connected mode to an island and mode. The one on the left is called a closed transition. This is typically a planned sequence, so you know it's going to happen. Ideally, your sources spin up, they start reducing what you're pulling from the utility, so they start producing the power locally, and when it gets to zero that you're pulling from the utility, you open up your device and now you're islanded. Uh, it's very smooth, there's no loss of power, and the time frame can be fairly quick. An open transition is different. Um, it's typically unplanned, um, and the utility instantly goes out, and typically the microgrid does as well. Um, at this point, you spin up your generators, you re-energize everything, and you bring it up. And at that point, your, your microgrid has power. Uh, it's a short duration outage, um, anywhere from a few seconds to a couple minutes. There are ways to avoid that short outage. Um, typically, they're expensive and complex to implement uh, and not typically done. And so typically, the open transition is what happens when the utility goes out, and then all other transitions are closed. So they're usually, the only time you have a loss of power is when the utility goes down. All right, next slide. Give you an example of how the system operates and kind of balances sources and loads when it's in islanded mode. Um, I kind of created this uh, example just uh, to show the difference between uh, when you have just a generator and a PV versus when you have a generator PV and a battery and how kind of those two different systems operate. The one on the left um, shows kind of like a single day and um, the gray is the generator and the orange is the load. So most at night, um, basically the generator runs and provides all of the load. Um, you can see during the day, the blue line, the PV production starts coming up and the generator goes down to a much lower level. Um, the generator can't turn off in this scenario because PV is not capable of making its own voltage. Uh, and therefore, it has to have a generator there to provide voltage. And therefore, um, you don't want the generator to run at, a, at no load. Um, so typically, uh, it's going to curtail the PV and not allow it to produce too much. This is different than the scenario on the right. In the scenario on the right, where you add an energy storage unit, um, the nighttime looks the same, so the generator supplying all of the power. But when the PV production starts going up and, and goes past what your load is, um, at that point, you can actually turn the generator off. The energy storage unit can provide the voltage for the PV array to push against. So not only is the PV providing all of the power for the load, but it's also being charged uh, but it's also charging your battery. So you can see the power for the battery storage actually goes negative because it's being charged. Um, so it gets charged kind of in the middle of the day. And then after the sun starts going down, the battery starts discharging. The generator stays off because it's still not needed. And then eventually the battery is kind of discharged and the battery uh, would transition over to the generator and the generator would run the rest of the night. Um, just to kind of give you an example of what it looks like uh, when it is running islanded. All right, next slide. All right, so uh, you can go to the next slide. So I wanted to kind of talk about components and what they look like. Um, in a microgrid, there's typically a lot of different uh, components uh, that make up what's in the microgrid. You end up with a lot of generation, energy storage, uh, lines, and switching devices. Most of these I've kind of already talked about. Um, there's also a lot of protection devices. So things like uh, circuit breakers and reclosers and fuses. Um, there's also sometimes uh, power factor correction. Um, so not only on the grid do you have real power, which is what your loads are consuming, 
um, but you also have reactive power. Anytime you transmit real power, you also need to provide reactive power for the transmission um, and a lot of the components. And power factor correction is a way of assisting and making the transmission system a little bit more efficient. And then there's a few examples of uh, some symbols that you might see on, on one lines. Um, and then uh, on the right is kind of a more of a picture representation of what some of these components look like. Next slide. So diving into sources a little bit more, um, most of these I've already mentioned. Uh, fuel generators, uh, can grid form. Um, that's the technical term to basically say it can produce its own voltage and therefore doesn't need another source to do that for it. Typically, diesel is a little bit more stable, although natural gas generators have lower emissions. Um, so it depends on kind of what the end state is uh, and what's required. They share load really easily between themselves because the fairly uh, well-developed technology. Wind and PV cannot grid form, so they have to have another source online to be able to generate voltage. Very variable, uh, but is curtailable. So you can tell it, even if it has the capability of producing a megawatt, you can say, don't produce more than 500 kilowatts. Hydro is a little bit different. Sometimes it can grid form, and it's a lot less variable. Um, so there are systems out there that rely heavily on hydro. Energy storage is a much different technology. Um, it can also grid form. Um, there are tons of different options in terms of how the energy is stored. And essentially it has two ratings to it. There's a kilowatt rating, which affects how stable the system is. It allows it for the generators to turn off and it allows for more renewables to be on the system, where the kilowatt hour rating is a duration. So it's how long it can operate. And typically, the main benefit for larger kilowatt hours is to reduce fuel usage. All right, next slide. All right, so a little bit more on uh, energy storage. Um, kind of the upper left graph is kind of why we're focusing on storage. Um, storage has come down quite a bit in cost uh, and is still continuing to come down in cost, um, which is an important driver um, as well as the operational modes. Um, so if you look at the use cases in the bottom left, um, those are expanding as well. They're figuring out more and more what can energy storage do. Um, and how it can help not only the grid, but also kind of these islanded situations. Um, they can provide uh, instantaneous power like a UPS and switch back and forth really fast. Um, however, it's, it's a lot different than a generator um, and it creates a couple of complications because of that. It has a much faster response time. Uh, it typically reacts and controls voltage and frequency much better. Um, it produces lower fault currents. Um, so I forgot to mention this earlier. So fault currents. Um, so the protection system relies on fault currents to detect when there's a problem. If fault currents are high, um, they can react very quickly and identify that there's an issue. Um, and when you're connected to the grid, high currents make the protection system operate very well. When you have low current, typically it's much harder to detect um, that there is a problem, and therefore the protection system typically has to be able to figure out if you're in grid-connected mo grid mode versus islanded mode, um, when, how much current to react to. Another way that their diff uh, energy storage is different than a generator is uh, they can absorb power um, and they can be programmed to emulate generators. Uh, when you have a system that has a combination of energy storage and generators, uh, it's nice to be able to program the energy storage to be operate like the um, operate like the generators so that they can share power better. And then a few other considerations. Um, round trip efficiency is typically around 90%. 
This means that if you put one megawatt hour into a battery, you're only gonna get 0.9 out of it, 0.9 megawatt hours out of it. Operations can have a large impact on lifespan. If the more you cycle it and the higher you charge and discharge it, the, the least amount of time it's gonna last. Um, if you charge it to 100%, and discharge it to 0% and you do that 10 times a day, um, the battery's probably not gonna last more than a couple of years. Whereas if you're going between say 40 and 60% and you're only doing that once a day, it could last 30 years. Um, so it makes a big impact on how it's operated. They are significantly more complicated to control than uh, generators, not only just the energy storage unit itself, but the rest of the components on the microgrid. Um, there are a lot of additional capabilities, um, but it definitely creates some challenges as well. Typically, it's made of two elements. There's an inverter and uh, whatever the storage mechanism is. Most of the storage mechanisms are DC, so um, a lot of the batteries, uh, flow batteries, um, uh, things that aren't spinning are typically DC. So the, the inverter is what's used to convert the DC power into AC power, and so it can connect to the grid. All right, next slide. All right, so this is the last thing I wanted to go over, um, and then I have a kind of a summary slide. The, there's different layers of controls that you typically see on a microgrid. Um, they're typically broken into three main categories. The top level is the tertiary control. Very slow, typically it's in minutes or hours. It's all the interactions with the larger grid. It typically has to do uh, all the time that you're dealing with economics or weather. Um, so very slow moving um, kind of actions are determined by the tertiary controller. The secondary controller is where uh, is typically called the microgrid controller. Uh, this is typically medium speed, so uh, seconds to minutes. It balances loads and sources, so to make sure that you always have enough sources to provide your loads. Uh, it's updating set points, it's going through sequences, and it's kind of the overall controller. Below that is the primary control. The primary controller are typically embedded in all of the components, and these are items like a generator controller or a controller, a programmable logic controller. There's a lot of different components that kind of fit in this category. They're very fast. So typically milliseconds to seconds. They typically have the primary goal of stabilizing voltage and frequency across the grid and providing fault protection. But they're very quick and respond first. Then the microgrid control kind of updates it after something's happened. And then the tertiary control kind of guides the whole thing. All right, next slide. And that was, what I wanted to go over, um, this is kind of just a summary of a lot of the components and hopefully it was useful. Um, kind of went through from what a microgrid is, some of the benefits and uh, how it's designed and what are some of the components are in it. So hopefully this was useful to give you a little bit of background um, in terms of what a microgrid is, some of the components. Um, and uh, with that, I will pass it off back to James. Thanks, Bob. Excellent presentation. A lot of good information there and great background on, on microgrids in general. Um, very challenging topic to cover briefly, but I appreciate that that overview. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jana Ganyan. Jana, you're welcome to proceed as soon as your slides are up. Actually, one moment. There, there are a couple hands up that I've seen. Um, if, you, if you're looking to ask a question, uh, we'll take written questions. So rather than raise your hand, uh, click on the question mark icon and type a written question. And at the end of, of all the presentations, we'll, we'll, we'll answer those questions. So um, uh, uh, with that, uh, Jana, you're free to proceed. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. I just want to do a quick sound check. Am I being heard all right? Sound um, great. Great. Um, so just really quickly, I want to um, say that the Blue Lake Rancheria tribe serves on the Department of Energy's 
um, Office of Indian Energy's National Working Group, the um, uh, Indian Country Energy and Infrastructure Working Group, um, which we fondly refer to as ISUIG. And we also serve on other um, energy, climate, and infrastructure advisory and technical committees um, at the state and national level. Um, for the work pairing climate and energy um, with resilience, the tribe has been recognized with FEMA's Whole Community Preparedness Award um, as a climate action champion by the Department of Energy and um, has also earned a 2019 Green Power Leadership Award from the EPA. Um, so I, I don't say these things to, um, uh, uh, to brag, but I do say them because uh, it is true that in developing our microgrid strategy, um, we are out there on the leading edge um, and are, are getting recognized for it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the Blue Lake Rancheria is located about five miles inland from the Pacific coast in Northern California. We're near the cities of Arcata and Eureka. Uh, the tribe is moving as fast as possible to a goal of zero net greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. We're well on our way um, to hit that goal. And we describe this region's tenuous utility connections to the outside world as behind the redwood curtain. Um, so we're famous for our redwoods, but we're also rural and geographically a bit isolated out here. Um, this is, of course, a condition that many tribes share. Uh, for example, in our case, we have um, one 10 inch natural gas pipeline and just two 115 kV power lines serving the entire region. The power lines run through wildfire country and all of our infrastructure sits in an area of very high earthquake and tsunami risk. Further, uh, climate change is amplifying our historic threats and vulnerabilities in terms of sea level rise, drought, warmer soils, higher temperatures, more volatile weather, and these are leading to um, recent disasters such as mega wildfires um, and also planned and unplanned power outages that are more frequent and now last for several days. Um, as a quick example, in October and November of this year, we had two extended power outages that were pre-planned to some degree and intended to prevent wildfire in um, a weather situation that, uh, that was where the conditions were ripe for the electrical system causing wildfires. So these outages lasted for many days <clears throat> and importantly, impacted 30 counties in Northern California simultaneously. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, how our microgrids performed in those events in a minute. So while uh, historically utilities have been relatively reliable and stable here, um, certainly in Northern California and, and in places across the United States and, um, and also particularly in Alaska, tribes, many tribes still have never been connected to the grid. But where they are connected um, and where historical power has been of somewhat reliable quality, we're seeing in our region recently that outages uh, of the kind that I'll talk about in a minute have really eroded the confidence in the larger grid, um, which has shifted the focus and conversation and development to more distributed generation, uh, both segmentation of the grid and uh, microgrids. So these climate impacts are not a surprise. These conditions have been studied and predicted for decades. However, they are severe, um, and the tribe has incorporated the facts and implemented strategic plans with climate smart solutions at their core. Um, the the uh, photo of this page is a little blurry. I apologize for that. But this is a at the center of it is a about a 25 acre wildfire that um, blew up. Um, it's right across the street from the tribal territory. Thank, thankfully, no one was injured in this event. Um, but I just want to reiterate that this is just a couple miles inland from the Pacific coast in an era, uh, in an area where we have never seen wildfires before. Next slide, please. So um, we also live on shaky ground here. 
Um, it's one of the riskiest earthquake regions in the United States and what's called the triple junction of faults just offshore from us. So this image depicts earthquakes of magnitude three and above over the last several decades. Um, and again, I'll just reiterate that our sole natural gas pipeline runs through the area. So really, um, we're not counting on natural gas being available um, in, in our planning. And due to the location of the Cascadia subduction zone, the Pacific coast uh, can be simultaneously impacted by a single very large earthquake event. And if that happens, um, and it's happened in the past and will happen again in the future, we just don't know when, our region will not be the first concern for responders in the case where Seattle and Portland and San Francisco um, and other major metropolitan areas uh, are, are impacted at the same time. Next slide, please. Um, so volatile weather here uh, has, has always been something that we've dealt with, but it is amplified by these changing climate um, crisis conditions, and it increases our typical landslide profile. So we have three arterial uh, highways that serve our region, and it is pretty typical for all of them to be out of service simultaneously. Um, these service disruptions and, and landslides can take days or weeks to remove. Um, and this, of course, means that shipments to our region are often disrupted, food, other supplies. And of course, for the purposes of this conversation, we can't rely on shipments of gas and diesel for our backup generators. So we are transitioning to solar and storage for our on-site generation needs as fast as possible. Next slide, please. I want to take a minute because we are receiving uh, lots of inquiry about how the tribe plans and prioritizes its projects, um, particularly microgrids. So within our strategic planning, we take a lifeline sector approach to prioritizing projects. And we define those lifeline sectors as energy, water, food, transportation, and communications and IT, which we bundle together. And of course, those sectors aren't silos. They overlap in many ways, and they are designed to improve um, community health and economic opportunity um, by keeping them uh, robust, and that's why we focus there. So we started with the energy lifeline sector because power supports, of course, all the other lifelines. Um, and we understand the changing environment, um, the disruptions that the climate crisis um, is amplifying, and we actively focus on the need for resilience and continuity of operations. We are working hard to um, change the, the sort of business as usual thinking to ensure that our emergency preparedness uh, and resilience projects and infrastructure hardening are also ideally zero carbon solutions. Um, our solutions to deal with climate issues should not make the underlying climate problem worse. And so the tribe has set a goal of zero net carbon emissions by 2030 in line with what the experts tell us is the timeline we have to meet. And importantly, these infrastructure investments are improving the tribe's economy. The climate smart transition has created more jobs, more capacity and expertise within the tribal community, ancillary economic development, and better social outcomes. So by ensuring robust climate smart power, we are ensuring a robust community. Next slide, please. Um, though I'm primarily going to discuss microgrids today, I want to mention that energy efficiency is always our first step before constructing more complicated and costly systems. Um, an example of the benefits of this are that though retail costs of electricity are high in places in California, it should also be noted that the state has some of the lowest average household energy bills in the country because of its deployment of energy efficiency. Uh, tribal communities are lagging behind in energy efficiency, weatherization, and other uh, of these approaches. Um, so we are constantly working to make sure that energy efficiency um, is at the center of these kinds of uh, energy sovereignty build out. 
Uh, the Blue Lake Nigeria tribe has three microgrids currently, um, a community scale, which has been in operation for two years, and it's noted by the uh, solid orange square to the top right. A facility scale microgrid that's in the last stages of commissioning, it should come online this month, and that's um, denoted in the dotted orange line to the bottom right. And then our campus scale, which is in design, which we hope to bring to fruition um, in by, by Q1 of 2021. And these nested or clustered microgrids provide us with on-site redundancy. If one microgrid uh, fails for whatever reason, an equipment malfunction um, or other reasons, um, if it goes down, the others can uphold our government programs and economic enterprises pretty well. Next slide, please. So, uh, as Bob um, very uh, expertly explained, microgrids are a popular term in energy circles um, and I just really want to add to what his comprehensive overview stated. Um, which is that we describe microgrids as mini electrical grids that can disconnect from the larger grid if they are connected to the larger grid and generate and use their own electricity for as long as needed. Um, when we are operating separate from the grid, as Bob said, it's called islanded mode. And we operate in islanded mode when the larger grid is out, like we have re recently seen in our region. And then when we want to, we can reconnect to the larger grid um, and when we are connected, of course, it's called grid connected mode. Grid connected mode is how our systems operate in business as usual, non-emergency situations. Um, and in business as usual, our microgrid helps us reduce the cost of electricity, use more and more, and more green power, um, in our case, solar, solar photovoltaics uh, paired with large scale lithium ion battery storage. And just a note, um, because we have done successive microgrid projects, we have seen firsthand how solar PV and battery storage costs are quickly falling. And the solar plus storage combination was by far the most cost effective for us over its 20 year lifespan in terms of purchase price, warranties, O&M, operations and maintenance, and other considerations. And another note on this, part of the reason why the cost of batteries in particular are plummeting is the state of California and other states sell um, incentives for battery storage purchases. So in California, there is a program called the Self-Generation um, Incentive Program, SGIP for short, which has directed hundreds of millions of dollars to battery purchase rebates. The tribe participates in this program, and it's part of the reason we've been able to scale up battery production rapidly to reduce the costs for uh, individual entities. Our microgrid was built by a public-private partnership uh, led by the tribe with engineering leadership from the Shops Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University. They're located about five miles away from us. Um, and at the project partnership also included several of the Department of Energy's national labs, particularly Idaho National Lab, and their hardware in the loop testing uh, facility there. Uh, the project was funded by the tribe and an energy research and development grant from the State of California uh, Energy Commission. Um, the microgrid powers a six building campus, including the tribal government offices, economic enterprises, and the infrastructure that serves those facilities. The, the brain of the system is um, the microgrid uh, management control system. Um, and it's programmed to uh, optimize uh, all of the components for economics and to, sh to load shed, to shed electricity uses when we need to. So if we know we're going to have a multiple day outage where the, we need to conserve and stretch our on-site power resources, we can shed more of our power needs. And the control system also allows us to enter in different electricity rates, um, including time of use rates, and will automatically optimize the microgrid subsystem for economic and environmental benefits. Uh, the microgrid also helps take pressure off the larger regional grid by providing a larger portion of our power on site. It allows us to peak shave and reduce the volatility of imports from the, from the regional grid as well. 
and it has reduced costs and our carbon footprint. Saves the tribe about 200,000 a year on electricity costs and lowers the greenhouse gases by about 200 tons per year. As I said, we primarily rely on solar, solar PV and battery storage. Um, I can't say enough good things about them. Um, and uh, one of the best things, of course, is that our fuel is free every day. We don't have to worry about deliveries of the sun arriving. Next slide, please. Um, so this first microgrid works so well, we're building others. Our latest is the facility scale uh, microgrid for our fuel station and convenience store. We call this Solar Plus. Now, when we think of gas stations with convenience stores, with, which many tribes have as a part of their economic enterprise portfolios, we seldom think of the lifeline sectors they can provide in emergencies, which is all of them. Fuel station and convenience stores can provide power, water, food, of course, transportation and communications, but they can't provide these services if they don't have power. So the facility microgrid seeks to create a replicable resilience package for these types of buildings um, to lower costs in business as usual and provide power in emergencies for as long as it's needed. So this microgrid is similar to the tribe's uh, larger one in that it has been constructed uh, with the same types of partnerships um, including um, uh, state funding from the state of California and engineering from the Shots Energy Research Center. It is also powered uh, by solar PV and lithium ion battery storage. Um, and I, I guess one of the things that we've seen, which I'm going to talk about uh, in just a second, is that the emergency services role of these facilities is especially important in rural areas where a gas station, a convenience store complex, or a grocery store, or a tribal government office may be the only community resource in a large rural area. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the outages um, uh, that, that we were um, beset by uh, uh, in the last couple months. Um, the outages in October are called uh, public safety power shutoff. Um, so, and and I want to talk about how the microgrids were, you know, worked in these real world situations, um, which we did uh, treat as emergencies. Uh, in a nutshell, they're working well. So, um, to combat wildfire risk that is present throughout the West and particularly in California. Um, utilities in California here are shutting down the electrical grid in dry, hot, windy conditions that could result in electrical systems causing a wildfire. Um, to give you a sense of scale, both October shutoffs impacted, uh, as I said, over 30 counties at once with millions of people without power. The length of the outages, depending on where you were in that 30 county area, were one to six days. And due to our microgrids, the tribe was able to, to stay up and running and provide emergency and other services to a significant portion of our region, again, which was entirely without power. So a few highlights here. Um, we were able to ration fuels and serve thousands of individuals and dozens of emergency response agency, agencies. Um, we were able to set up an emergency command center with robust access to the internet and digital communications. We provided uh, in our hotel critical metal, medical housing for people who need power for medical equipment. And in the event, we were credited by our local health and human services department with saving four lives. Um, we also housed wildfire evacuees in the late October outage because that outage did coincide with a major wildfire to the south of us. So families who evacuated had to come, had to travel long distances because power was out over wide swaths of the state um, and they were able to find refuge here um, at the Rancheria. Our electric vehicle charging stations were an important resource. 
Um, Humboldt County has a high relative adoption rate of EVs, electric vehicles, and in the outage, people came to Blue Lake Rancheria to charge vehicles. We also opened community and business centers where people could come charge devices, do their work, um, access the internet, and of course, obtain food and other necessities. Local businesses uh, continue to operate with this kind of access, including our county paper record, which came here to publish. And we worked with community clinics, medical clinics, um, to keep medicines refrigerated and stable, which is another need um, that we really need to think through in our tribal communities. Um, in addition, we kept all the tribe's businesses functioning normally. So microgrids are really proving the effectiveness of combining climate action and reliability. And when we do that, we provide equity. Resources for all with the ability to prioritize um, our responders and those most in need, like our elders and our medically compromised people. Next slide, please. So um, just some reflections, you know, though our outages, the, the planned ones anyway, were authorized by the state um, and enacted by our regional utilities, um, uh, they were thankfully relatively short this time around. The longer term predictions are that these kinds of outages are going to be part of our future for the next decade and that they are projected to last from two to five days and possibly up to 10 days, depending on the damage sustained in any particular event. So here, um, in the outages that we experienced, there were some lessons learned. Um, one is that at about the 30-hour mark, we saw communications falter in areas as cell towers and other communications infrastructure ran out of backup power. So that's one of the areas we need to fix because digital communications are, of course, essential in emergencies. Uh, we are grateful that our uh, continuity of operation powered by our microgrids was widely appreciated. But of course, these events are a crash course in the new climate force era we are in and the ways in which we need to take action um, to ride through these events. So we're working with others to rapidly scope whether we can do more regional segmentation of the electrical grid, which will be a combination of upgrades to existing infrastructure and even more new microgrids. Next slide, please. And because of this increased focus of, on microgrids, we are receiving um, lots of inquiry from tribes and others across the country seeking to um, build these out. Um, particularly with low carbon generation. So here are some considerations for getting started. Um, the tribal count, and I'll talk about it mainly from Blue Lake Rancheria's perspective, um, but there's information here that people can follow up with as needed. The tribal council has formally approved the microgrid strategy. Um, it has dedicated staff to develop and operate these projects. Uh, the tribe decided to retain tribal ownership of all the infrastructure. So, so some of the ways that you can develop are, of course, through um, the tribe can develop internally um, and or it can partner with third party entities to develop. Um, in, in Blue Lake Rancheria's case, uh, we operate mainly at what we call the community or campus scale, um, facility scale and residential scale. So most of the time, it doesn't make sense in terms of the capital cost of any particular project to enter into a third party financing or O&M relationship. Um, we have launched a tribal a, a utility authority to manage the energy uh, projects and infrastructure that we have built. And we've developed strategic partnerships that I've talked about um, really by far the most valuable has been with the local university, Humboldt State University. Um, it allows us to develop cap capacities um, within the tribal community in concert with, um, with the local educational institution that is intrinsically uh, devoted to knowledge transfer. And as I've mentioned, the Shots Energy Research Center is located at Humboldt uh, University. And so uh, 
that's a um, very convenient um, way to access engineering expertise that over the course of developing microgrid projects has really become some of the um, some of the leading edge expertise um, in the country. We also work with a variety of public and private partners um, at all levels, and these partnerships have made our microgrid uh, projects possible. Um, funding came from the tribe and from grants and incentives that I've mentioned. It's always a puzzle to pull together financing, but it absolutely can be done. The tribe supported these projects with matching funds and other injections of capital as needs arose. And of course, they will arise in, in these kinds of projects. And the tribe took a patient payback approach, estimating about 10 years of the simple payback timeframe for infrastructure projects. We've received technical assistance from the Department of Energy Office of Indian Energy, um, and that has been provided largely by national lab experts, and um, it's been a great help. And on the right side of the slide are some of the funding and programs we have accessed. It is by no means a complete list. Um, and in addition, depending on what state uh, tribal lands or states tribal lands are located in, there may be other state level funding incentives that are available, especially where tribal and state energy objectives are aligned. Next slide, please. So uh, I just I sort of want to bring this to a close by talking about microgrids as solutions. Um, they have proven themselves here to have stacked benefits, economic and community resilience, greenhouse gas reductions are chief among them. Um, but microgrids also provide the opportunity to rethink electrical grid investment overall. As we shift from uh, uh, from climate forcing energy systems in favor of climate smart solutions, we are increasingly electrifying our lives, appliance, cars, heating and cooling, other needs. So we will need at least as much or more power, and that will come from sources that will not further degrade the climate uh, and cause these kinds of impacts. So. Thinking about how our microgrids have performed, we can value their benefits in new ways. It's really a combination of routine grid upgrades that can be shifted from trend, uh, traditional transmission lines, for example, to microgrids. Um, this allows for segmentation and more sophisticated management of the grid to enable benefits for everybody, especially, especially tribal communities. And how we value and pay for these systems includes the business as usual value of normal business operation, um, but also how these systems function in emergency to increase abilities to take care of the public, um, our members, and to provide benefits um, to larger regions. We are also considering the operation and management of microgrids and how best to do that. Um, they're not, as, as Bob's uh, presentation uh, illustrated, they're not simple. And um, even as we build capacity within tribal communities to manage this infrastructure, um, to get microgrids built fast and all over the place, we may want to engage um, with region, regional utilities and other partners that likely already have that expertise to get the job done, but with a knowledge transfer mechanism built in, ideally. Um, we are working on how to transfer the knowledge and technical assistance from microgrids, um, from microgrids so that we enable more tribes and others to build microgrids um, and also avoid costly pitfalls. So we're working to create what we refer to as microgrid centers of excellence to serve essentially as a one-stop shop for microgrid development. Um, this would include a starting place for planning and firmly centering the tribal community needs at the center of design and feasibility. So as we go, we obviously want to avoid inappropriate technology. We want to increase standardization so these things are easier, easier to build and connect with a larger grid. We want to lower um, capital costs and we want to lower operation and maintenance burdens. Next slide, please.
Um, so in, just in closing, I think, you know, we see that this is an era of unparalleled focus on the nexus of climate, energy, and resilience, and developing a coordinated strategy to transition to, to a climate smart society. Tribes are clearly leading the way. Uh, many have already built microgrids, and many have microgrids in development. And the private sector is joining because the economics of transitioning to zero emission energy sources are aligning very well with their business objectives and consumer preference. The goal is to power everything we do with electricity and to generate that electricity from climate healing sources. We need bold, clear action to clean up the energy sector and use that clean energy to power transportation and other lifeline sectors that we've talked about. Um, the good news is we're already seeing success and we look forward to much more as quickly as possible, preferably. Um, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentations, but if there are other questions we don't get to today, please feel free to email me at the address here. Thank you so, so much for your kind attention. Thanks, Jana. Excellent presentation as always. We really appreciate your sharing your insights on, on your um, microgrid and, and the successes it's had. Um, our next presenter is, is Dave Messier. D Dave, um, uh, you can start in just one moment, but I did want to mention we are running just a bit behind schedule. So with our last two presentations, if we can uh, work to stay at about 20 minutes, we'll have time for for um, questions, and we certainly do have questions coming in. So just keep that in mind, I appreciate it. Thanks, Dave, go ahead. No problem, thank you, sir. And uh, first off, I wanted to just start by um, acknowledging that Jan has a really hard act to follow and just you know, saying congratulations to Blue Lake. And I remember hearing Jana present at the end of September um, about some of the issues they were expecting and to hear this presentation and the lives that were saved and all the benefits that have come from their microgrid. It's just super impressive. And I just wanted to commend Blue Link Ranch Rancheria um, really quickly. So anyway, I'll move on. So uh, our project is Sustainable Solar Energy for Hughes Village Council. It's uh, located in the community of Hughes, Alaska. You can skip slides. And this is a, a rough map of Alaska, and this is where Hughes is. I work with Tana Chiefs Conference. We represent 37 federally recognized tribes over an area roughly the size of Texas with fewer miles of road than Rhode Island. And if you turn on all of our microgrids across the region, it would be roughly the load of uh, a normal sized hospital. So here in Fairbanks, we have Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. I estimate about 10 megs is probably their peak. And that would be our max load if you turned on all of our rural generators in the 40 or so rural communities that we've got. So very spread out uh, micro, a range of microgrids um, across a subarctic region of the state that uh, historically many communities have had to fly in fuel or rely on barged in fuel. Skip slide. So for Hughes, they had contacted me a, a number of years ago uh, about what they could do to move their community away from diesel. They're currently flying only for fuel. And we started looking at what the vision for the community of Hughes was. And they have some great leaders in this community. Uh, I work with a number of communities and the, the range in terms of capacity across my communities is really all over the place. Hughes is definitely kind of a shining star in terms of the leaderships the leadership that they have in that community and their ability to move from community plan to actionable steps and, and getting projects completed. Next slide. So you can see a list of a few of the projects that they've completed just in the last few years. Not uh, super sexy. This is a community of about 90 people located on the Kaikuk River, roughly 200 miles from Fairbanks, 800 river miles from Nanana, the closest port. And so very isolated, uh, just south of the Arctic Circle, but pretty cold, obviously. And you can tell from the, the list, this is, uh, this is not a uh, casino-owning tribe in Lower 48 with a significant amount of, of business opportunity. This is a group of 90 or so people who have been in this community for thousands of years, generations, and are trying to survive in, a, in the 21st century. Next slide. So I'm sure there are folks on the call from communities across the country and tribes across the country, and uh, every community has a different source of electricity. I, I'm 
talking today from Fairbanks. We're relying on a mix of coal, naphtha, diesel, and natural gas, and we've got some wind power and solar in the mix. Probably not much solar today, but across the region, there, or across the country, there are a lot of natural gas generators, coal generators, etc. So in the community of Hughes, this is the Hughes Village power plant. There are four diesel generators in there, and that is where 100% of the electricity consumed and in the community of Hughes comes from, this building right here. And you can see the national average for electricity is right around 11 cents a kilowatt hour. In Hughes, it's 71 cents a kilowatt hour. Next slide. So the challenge in Hughes that we were faced with was how do we get from here to here? So, so the plane on the left, I'll stress, is a DC-6. You might not recognize it if you don't live up in Fairbanks. We have the Everett's Air Fuel Company, which operates the largest fleet of DC-4 and DC-6 aircrafts, I think probably in the world. Most of them are from, well, all of them are from the 50s and 60s because I think production of these aircraft ended in the early 60s, but they were flown during the Korean War and they have proved to be an economical source of transporting fuel from our hub in Fairbanks out to a number of communities across the, across the region. And so when you think about the supply chain of your community, Jana had mentioned uh, the challenges with fuel trucks and uh, gas lines in her area, and I'm sure many of you are similarly constrained in remote areas. The community of Hughes is, is very constrained in their mind because that's where all of their fuel comes from is those planes. And if they have some sort of issue with their runway or what have you, they've got a very limited supply of diesel that they can rely on to keep the lights on. And electricity in the community of Hughes really powers everything. It is uh, it is their clinics, their water plants, their school, their runway lights, et cetera. So it is incredibly important, especially when we get temperatures down to negative 70, negative 60 during the cold parts of the year. Next slide. So the challenge that we often come up against is folks saying, hold on there, Alaska, you guys don't have any sun up in Alaska. Why are you implementing solar PV? And so here is a map of the solar resource in Alaska. And you can see that compared with the lower 48, and uh, I think that's Spain over on the right. And then you can see the country of Germany on the right side of the screen. And if you take the time to look at the solar irradiance values in the bottom, you can see that the interior of Alaska, Fairbanks, and the surrounding communities actually have a better solar resource than the com than this country of Germany. And Germany, I believe, still holds the record of having the largest amount of solar PV installed per capita. And that's partially because of the incentives that they've got over there, which I think are driven by some of their energy security challenges and trying to uh, reduce their dependence on imported natural gas from Russia. And so we have a fairly similar situation with all of our communities. If something happens in the Middle East, you have energy costs for your school, for your water plant, for your tribal businesses, for everything increase and you have zero control over it. So the solar PV project in Hughes is really to attempt to, uh, to mitigate that risk of, of having no control over your fuel supply. So next slide, when folks ask if we've, you know, why we're doing solar when we don't have much of a solar resource, I always come back to the DC4s and the DC6s that we are dependent on for fuel. And we've looked at wind as a resource in our communities. And unfortunately, wind is very site specific. And so many of our communities, even that do have a wind resource, it's located five miles away from the community with transmission costs up in rural Alaska between 500000 and a million dollars a mile. The transmission costs to bring the wind resource or other renewable asset into the community is very challenging and, and very cost prohibited. And with solar PV, we have a fairly um, equal amount of solar that hits the ground in a community versus five miles away. So we have more flexibility when it comes to the location. Next slide. And when Hughes wanted to begin their process of reducing their dependence on imported diesel, the Department of Energy was, uh, we were very fortunate and uh, Leslie Kabodis came up. She was a contractor with the DOE and she ran a, kind of an energy vision session with the community and they came out with a renewable portfolio standard. And I would stress that this is something that any tribal community can come together on and tr tr try to guide tribal operations and, and the future of the, of the tribe's energy sources. We found in Hughes and some of our other communities that we've implemented this in that it kind of provides a goal and a direction as leadership changes, as council members change, we can kind of come back to this renewable portfolio standard that 
uh, the tribe put out and, and point to it as a goal that we're all headed towards. Next slide. This is a look at the power plant in the community of Hughes. This is where 100% of their electricity comes from. Those are the two operators on either side of the young ladies up there who are uh, assisting with a remote diesel maintenance plan. Gilbert and Sean, those are two of the most important folks in the community of Hughes because they keep those older diesel generators running and providing power when it's 40 below and when it's 40 above. And so without those two guys, the community is in a, a much more challenging energy security situation. Next slide. The project goals for our solar PV array were threefold. The most importantly was to increase tribal energy security and resiliency. And then we also, what, what TCC does is one of our functions is we're able to consolidate some of the resources and share those with communities across our region and across the state. So we're not trying to come up with a one-off solar PV diesel hybrid system. We are trying to come up with a model that can be utilized in other communities. And I'm proud to say that even with the, uh, the, the brief successes or the, the brief time we've had with the solar PV being up, we've had a number of communities, I would say half a dozen approaches and say, hey, how can we do in our community what's being done in Hughes? And so that's one of the functions that TCC provides, being able to share the information that we've gained, gained and help other communities implement this. And then finally, implement a financial model that allows solar PV to work with the power cost equalization, which is a residential subsidy that the state of Alaska has for individual residences that use less than 500 kilowatt hours a month. So trying to make sure that the renewable energy that we put on doesn't I guess, sacrifice or compromise any of the, it doesn't have the impact of increasing a small residence's electric bills. Next slide. So when we started the process up in Hughes, they are a fairly small community, only 90 people. I would say the radius around the powerhouse, which is there as building number 16 to the edge of the community is between, it's only about a quarter of a mile. So fairly small community geographically. And when it was originally electrified just back in the 70s, I believe, there were it was even smaller. It's grown a bit since then. And so they they implemented a single phase distribution and generation system, which means that there was only one phase across the community, and the generators were single set up as single phase generators. And so as the community has grown, that's had some limitations. And when we started this project, we thought that we could overcome those with power electronics and just by being creative when we sourced an inverter for the project and we soon realized that we couldn't overcome that challenge if we wanted to get a commercially viable three-phase generator I'm sorry inverter then we had to upgrade to a three-phase distribution and generation system so that was kind of step one which we weren't anticipating and we were able to accomplish that within a year we finished that up in 2018 I guess it was a year and a half and rewired the school and then brought three phase down the main lines rewired the generator ends and, and so we had three-phase power next slide Another thing we preach at TCC is energy efficiency first. The cheapest kilowatt hour is the one that you don't use. And so we had some funding from another source and went through the community and did a, an LED lighting upgrade with a local contractor from Huslia just down the river. And they went through every home and community building in Hughes and changed out all the lights from incandescent and fluorescent to LED. Next slide. So that reduced our overall demand in the community. And then we started planning our solar PV array. And this was the, this is what we, we were, we started with. This is a, a lot just to the south of the power plant. Next slide. And had some folks up in Hughes clear it. Is they're uh, exceptionally good at clearing brush up in Hughes. Everybody uses firewood to heat their homes. Uh, and they had a, a brush crew that swept through this in about a week and a half or so and mowed it down. It's been cleared even more than that. Next slide. And then in the summer, fall of 2018, so last year, we shipped up solar PV modules and found a local contractor, again, from Hughes, and I'm sorry, from Huslia, and were able to get the solar PV array up using 100% local labor, which is something that we were incredibly proud of. And also another, in our mind, benefit over other technologies, such as wind, where you really need to have outside entities come in for uh, technology like solar, we had guys show up with uh, a ratchet set. 
And if you get a, a really competent foreman, you can get a project knocked out. This took them about three or four weeks to put together. Can't stress, this is a photo of our contractor, Edwin Beifeld. He was really instrumental in helping us get to 100% local hire and get this system up for the cost that we were able to. Um, it's much easier if you're if you're flexible and willing to um, work locally with folks in the community. And Edwin took it upon himself to attend a Solar Energy International training, I think in early 2018, and was really hungry to get this project. And so he was a logical go-to vendor, and, and he did great. We went up and helped him put up the first array. Three weeks later, we had all of the uh, the array set up, 120 kW worth of PV panels, which was the largest solar PV array uh, in rural Alaska at the time. Next slide. The, in summer of 2019, just this last summer, we, we wired it. We've kind of been going a little bit slow because of budgetary challenges and trying to determine where we we're going to get the funding. But we have since solved that issue, and the batteries are going to be shipped up in um, spring 2020, so in just a few months. And so in fall, I think it was August 2019, we had Edwin go back up and wire the PV panels. Really proud to hit the number of $2.10 a watt for a system this remote out in the middle of rural Alaska. We're proud of the number and, and like to underscore that because it's something that's attainable even with our logistical challenges. Next slide. And in a remote setting up here in Alaska. And it really shows that folks in the community can do a lot of the work. And obviously that saves a ton of money when you're, you're talking about a contractor coming in from, let's say, Fairbanks or Anchorage out to a rural community. They've got to make a decent amount to, to make sure that it's worth it and deal with all the risks. And so typically they add zeros on the end of their estimates to deal with those risks. So when we talk about logistics and getting the product out to the community of Hughes, this is part of the path that it took. We got our racking from a company in Ridgefield Corners. It went by truck to Seattle and then actually by barge up to Anchorage trucked up to Nanana and then took another 800 mile barge journey down the Tanana and Yukon rivers and up the Kaikuk River. So had to plan ahead quite a ways for that. Next slide. And just be sure that we, we hit all of our deadlines and got the product into the community because we have one barge that goes up per year now. They just started that in 2018. It's the first time in over a decade that they've had barge service up there, but we were fortunate. Otherwise, we, we probably would have had an increased cost because air freight is significantly more expensive. And so you can see what the installed cost with shipping was, it was about 210 a watt. Had we just taken out the shipping um, or had a reduced shipping, it would have been closer to $1.84 a watt. So up here in Alaska, shipping is a huge component of our installed cost. Next slide. So the, the project is gonna be putting on this 120 kW of solar PV onto a microgrid that has I would say a peak load of around 120 kW. Most of the time it's base loaded in the 60 to 70 kW range during the summer. And that probably goes up to 80 to 90 kW during the winter with peaks up to 120 when they have uh, high, um, when they have potlatches or uh, Thanksgiving day peaks or what have you. So the goal here is to, to show you just a brief overview of how the system is gonna be tied into the main bus bar in the uh, power plants. And, and work seamlessly with the grid. And that's really important. You remember from the slides that uh, were shown by previous pre presenters, the challenge that a lot of entities in the lower 48 are dealing with is how to switch from the main utility provider to the microgrid and turn their microgrid on. We don't really have that challenge, if you will. We have plenty of other challenges, but we are on a microgrid. And so we're, in, we're incorporating the solar PV and the batteries right into the power plant. Next slide. We, were, we have been, I would say, benefiting from some of the changes in the battery market, most of which are due to the, the mandates that have been put in place down in California. They have been driving the cost of batteries lower since we started the project, and we could have gotten a battery set up in 2019, and our vendor said, well, if you wait a year, you can double the capacity of the battery and probably only add about 10%, just worth, in terms of cost, based on where battery um, battery prices are going. And so we made the determination to wait and we're now looking at an e-mesh system from ABB. We had previously been looking at a SAFT product and the cost of the ABB system is just coming down as they are working on uh, really getting into the Alaska market. Next slide. So this is an example from a community of Northway. 
This was my first battery system. It was on a, a small uh, building down in the community of Northway. And you can see we just did a, a 9 kW grid tied solar PV installation on this in summer 2018. And then we put a battery on it in 2019 this last summer. And this is representative of what we're trying to do in Hughes. So you can see the, the light green in the graph is what was previously going back into the grid, that, that lower line, that red line, and then dark blue and then purple. That is what uh, the base load in this community building down in Northway is. And so we put a 9 kW solar PV system. The community does not have net metering. And so all of the light green was previously going back onto the grid. We put a small 10 kWh battery system in there. And, and now instead of just getting the benefit of solar PV during that shaded blue area, and so it would come on about 6, a, 6 a.m. during the summer and really trail off about 8 PM during the summer, we're getting the benefits from that solar PV array all throughout the day until about 2 a.m. in the morning. And there's just that little area of red that we've got to buy from the energy provider, the local utility. And so this is kind of representative of what we're trying to do in Hughes once we turn the system on summer 2020. Next slide. And this is a, a graph model from our friends at NREL. They were able to assist us showing what that's going to look like. The blue is PV to load. The red is still diesel to load. So what we'll be needing to, when we'll be needing to turn the diesels on. But when you are 100% reliant on diesel, this might uh, look like a good start. And that's how we feel. It's not perfect, but we're not trying to get to perfection. We're trying to get to a better situation and less reliance on imported diesel. And this PV system definitely helps us do that. Next slide. So really quick, the, the challenges that we often deal with with small remote Alaskan microgrids are budgetary in nature. And the community of Hughes, uh, if they were to take on this project, they, they had some budgetary challenges, ended up we started with about $750,000 budget because we switched technologies from lead acid batteries to lithium ion and increased the cost. Next slide. And if they were to take out a loan for this project, you can see that they would still lead, they would still get them about a 20% cost increase, even with the reductions in fuel usage. So it's, it definitely has benefits, but the DOE funding has been super important and the support from the Office of Indian Energy because without any kind of additional support, we would have to go to finance this through a loan, and that would have the impact of increasing everybody's electric rates, essentially. So. So this funding is super important because we're trying to get to a sustainable model where we can really drive the cost down and, and get by in other projects with just loan financing. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. Next slide. So uh, this is a, just a short list of our project challenges and uh, we are tackling them and trying to knock them off the list one by one and hope to have our microgrid solar PV diesel battery system up and running by summer of 2020. Next slide. Um, just wanted to say thank you to the Department of Energy and the Office of Indian Energy for their support. And if anybody has any questions, my contact information is there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Excellent presentation. And thank you for, uh, you know, representing the challenges there in rural Alaska and um, uh, uh, and, and how you're overcoming them with, with solar and battery storage. That's, that's really cool. So um, our final presentation is from... Uh, uh, Dan, Dan Malcolm, and uh, he's going to be focusing on uh, 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 kind of a, a, a system that's been operating for, for a while now, a, a simpler system in, in many regards, but one that has a, a track record. So we wanted to make sure to represent that on this webinar. Um, and uh, Dan, looks like we have about 24 minutes left in the, in the webinar is scheduled. So um, if you can continue to try to keep the, the presentation under 20 minutes, we would uh, have time for questions. So. Appreciate uh, your efforts to do that. Um, and go ahead, Dan. All right, thank you very much. Um, again, Dan Malcolm, planning manager for the Albuquerque County to Bandicoot Indians. Um, this is our tribal government office. Next slide. What I'm going to, uh, this is the Albuquerque County Indian Reservation. So it's a checkerboard reservation, as you can see on the map, about 30,000 acres. Uh, it overlaps three cities and unincorporated Riverside County. Um, there's some flat areas that's urban and the mountainous areas to the southwest and where the project I'm going to talk about is located. Next slide. So the Indian Canyons Training Post, um, basically that's a facility that's two miles um, located from the grid, 700 square feet. 
Um, it's kind of a station there for people to go hike in, in the Indian canyons. Um, basically, there's, there's souvenirs there. There's also convenience items, uh, drinks, food, and whatnot. Uh, it's open seven days a week uh, during peak season, which is now down here, and only on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in the summers when it's very hot and we don't get too many visitors. Um, before 2008-9, it was powered by a 15-kilowatt propane generator um, that's shown in the bottom right there. Uh, that generator was getting old at the time. It was breaking down constantly, um, thousands of dollars in maintenance expenses. It was just... We were having reliability problems. We were having to bring out a, uh, a backup diesel generator on a trailer, park it outside the building. And so something had to be done. Um, we had two prior uh, grants uh, that looked at options, that evaluated the building, kind of looked at um, what the uh, uh, options were for that building and the um, actual load of that building. Uh, next slide. Um, so, at the results of all that, we looked at actually adding a PV system to the, the, um, the trading post and replace the, uh, the continuously operating propane generator with a, just a backup system. Um, so, it was actually completed in two phases, kind of due to funding. The first phase was late 2008 was to add a, uh, a 7.5 kilowatt diesel generator with one to two days worth of battery storage. And you can see the batteries there on the right and the generator on the bottom left. Um, this was based on a load of 34 kilowatts, the building with a peak load of 8 kilowatts and a, kind of an average load of 4 kilowatts when the business is open. Um, so that kind of driven the size of the solar system that was added later, which is an 8.25 kilowatt system, 30 panels. And the system is fully automated. And I'll get into like the next slide here. Next slide, please, on, on what kind of... Um, the particulars and kind of the challenges and lessons we learned as we were doing this, because this, again, was 10 years ago. So we did have a 24-7, uh, 365 operation requirement for that building. Basically, there's perishable items in there. We need power 24-7. Um, there's also, it's open to uh, um, um, visitors. So we do, it's a commercial business, so it generates revenue. So we had to need a system that was completely reliable. Um, it's down there in the site where the trading post is at. It actually gets... Usually pretty good sunlight all day long. However, it's against a mountain on the west side. So about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the building's covered in shade. So that kind of limits how much solar exposure we get. And the building is open until 5. Um, with respect to system sizing, what we didn't do originally when we first started this project, and it kind of happened as we were putting in the panels and the batteries, is we didn't look at efficiency. We should have done that up front. So we designed a system to do 34 kilowatt hours when we could have probably done less um, the good news is, is that when we replaced all the refrigerators, the, the uh, microwave that were in there and everything else, we actually lowered the, the um, power consumption of that building, which actually made the batteries last, our, our storage last longer and made our use of the generator almost non-existent, really, unless we have extended periods of cloud or, or, or rain, which doesn't happen too often down here. Um, at that time, as I did 10 years ago, there was limited options. Basically, there wasn't much out there as, as far as we could see. And we want it to be hands-free, basically, so the people operating the training post didn't have to worry about it, right? Um, we have canyon maintenance crew uh, personnel that can do this, but they're busy doing other things. So this is meant to operate on itself. So um, we incorporated built-in redundancy, so either the system could run off the batteries with the solar or it can run the generators. And what you see in the upper left there is we had a, pan a switch so we could isolate um, components of the system. So let's say the generator wasn't working, we can isolate it while we work on it. Or if let's say the, um, the uh, solar and the batteries aren't working, we can disconnect them from the system and run on the backup generator. Or if everything fails, which is what we were relying on before, is there's a power cord there at the bottom, we could run a cord out and hook up to the, the diesel generator. So basically, no matter what, we could always have power to the building. Um, there were some troubleshooting difficulties we had in the beginning of the system for the first couple of months. Uh, it, it, was, it was somewhat difficult to get off the ground, and there were some compatibility issues, which I'll cover in the next slide. Next slide. So shown here on the wall is during installation, we went with Xantrax uh, charge controller inverters. Those are the two rectangle boxes on the left. Um, the cool thing about those at the time, there's probably better technology now, is they could uh, instantly switch from taking power from the batteries, which are being charged through the, the solar, uh, to, to, in, to invert that to um, a 120 and power the building. 
when the batteries get low, it can instantly tell the generator to turn on and then switch over to generator power and then, then use the generator power to power the building and then also charge the batteries. That happens instantaneously and you don't notice anything going on inside the building. That's always worked great ever since the get-go. There was never a problem with that. Um, kind of the third box over on the right is just, that's breakers behind that, but the, the two little boxes on the, um, the far right are those charge controllers. As you can see, they're all Xantrex. They were compatible with the system. However, those two controllers never really charge the batteries. Basically, the SOAR panels go into those two charge controllers and they charge the batteries. The batteries then power the inverters. We weren't getting good um, um, charging on the batteries. If anybody's familiar, there's three different stages, uh, bulk, absorb, and float. It never really did. It never would bring the batteries up to full charge. Um, so we had to do something, and that was pretty much in the first couple of months this was going on. Next slide. So before we went to Outback, we actually tried micro uh, inverters on each panel. That didn't work either. Those That was brand new back then, I think 2009, so they couldn't get that to work either. So basically we found a company, Outback, and we installed three charge controllers. Not that three were better than two, but just they're smaller in size, so we needed three of them. And since we added those Outback charge controllers, and basically they take the power from the solar and charge the batteries, the batteries were getting uh, topped off every day. The system was working perfectly, and um, and and, and haven't, had a, haven't had an issue since with the um, the solar. So that's awesome. Um, basically, 10 years straight, no issues. Um, next slide. Um, Unique here is how the building works. We wanted remote monitoring to how to figure out how the system was working. And, and, and since we actually have generation and power consumption, we had to have two different monitors, one actually monitoring what the building is using and one monitoring what this, the, the, the solar system is, is, is generating at any given time. So to want to see if anything, if there's issues with one or the other. Um, that was working good for several years. Um, recently, it's kind of not, it's not been working. And the main issue with that is, is um, on the, on the far right corner, the, the solar connection for that is GPRMS, which I think the solar, the, the um, sorry, the cell, um, um, cell connection for that was GPRMS service, which everything's moved to, um, uh, I forget what the new terms are called, but we're all on um, different technology now. So I think the, the, the cell companies are phasing that out. So we've upgraded now to a new, um, basically a cell modem that gets this connection, we're just now getting that operating again. So that's another, just technology changes, so as things go on, just, that's not been a big issue, it's just, it's just to help know how the system's working. Um, next slide. Okay, this is kind of the end slide, as I said, I'm gonna go quick here, but uh, ours is a fairly straightforward project. Um, we were trying to eliminate one, uh, a, a very expensive um, propane and diesel generator ran system with um, battery backup and, and solar. Um, so this shows um, the graph here is the red would be if we, we had some improvements we had to do back in 2008, like replacing appliances and redoing the roof. So we had a sunk cost of 58,000 no matter what we were doing. Um, the total cost of the solar system was about $135,000 uh, with all the other stuff included. Um, we were able to get a grant to bring that cost down to 75,000. So what this graph shows in the first two years of operation, uh, we actually broke even. And since then, we've been um, actually saving money. And it kind of shows there is, is, is we expect to save, um, with the grant funding, about $217-ish thousand dollars uh, over the 20 years of operation of the system. So this is this huge cost uh, savings on this. Um, midway through the, um, you see on the two green and blue graphs, there's two, there's two um, kind of spikes in cost. And the only really operating cost we've had, and we had it at, eight, at the eight year mark, was to replace the batteries. Um, we went in the past, because that's all it really was, with lead acid batteries. We went with um, um, 16 um, uh, six volt uh, lead acid batteries. Um, and they were shown on one of the slides there. They're basically running two uh, uh, sets of, of eight that generate 48 volt system. So it's a 48 volt system and then, um, and then that gets converted, everything runs into, into 120 that we need. Um, so basically we got eight to nine years out of the first batteries. And that's actually outstanding for the desert down here. It, it gets in temperatures up to 115s and then 120 in the summer and, and lead acid batteries in cars, they don't last long. Usually you get about three years is it. 
Um, the important thing is there we have a, a actual swamp cooler that helps cool that that uh, that uh, room that that houses all that equipment, so it keeps the temp down there. So, and we also, as discussed in previous slides, we do not let the batteries get below 60%. Usually, typically 70% before we kick the generator on. Luckily, we have so, enough power where that rarely happens. So that's another thing is that we always top the batteries get topped off to full, and we usually don't let them get down um, lower than that, which I think is done really good on the cost and. Basically, those lead acid batteries cost us 18,000 to replace. So that's our upper. So another eight, nine years, we'll have another cost of that. Um, for probably down the road, someday we might look at a different technology. But right now, we would have to change a lot. We'd have to change the charge controllers and all that if we're going to go to lithium. So it's 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 not really worth it to us at this time uh, to to explore anything like that um, um, for this system. And next slide. And actually, that's it. So it's a fairly simple, small system. It's worked. Um, uh, it, it saves the tribe a lot of money. And, and one thing that was really nice, besides, you know, it does reduce carbon emissions and all that, but it really didn't. It really improved the visitor experience in the canyons down there, which you can find the website if you're, you're curious. Is that you didn't realize in the background there was always a generator humming along, and especially and once that went away, you could hear the birds and all the other wildlife around there. So that was you didn't realize the benefit of that until you until it happened and and, and that's was it's been an you know an, an unanticipated or, or uh, benefit that we didn't expect so um that's it that's my presentation and thank you very much thanks dan uh excellent and interesting presentation uh, we're going to jump to questions right now and, and and thanks dan for moving along so we'd have time for that um uh, I'm just going to go through them, and and first off, Dan, just while, while your presentation's fresh, uh, have you seen a, a, a decline in production from your solar uh, modules? Um, is it is it notable on your system over the 10 years, or um, uh, uh, can you comment on that? I, I you know what I don't know right now if it has. I know we haven't had any. As as I mentioned, we've had some issues with our monitoring system. The, the problem is Fat Spaniel went away and got bought by somebody else. So we had that problem on, on that migrating that. And then that recently the cell reception. So right now we're having an IT issue with that. Um, I haven't noticed anything. Another way to look at that is is if um, the generator hasn't been coming on. So, I mean, still we're, we're, we're good there. So that's another, uh, another um, kind of data point for us. Since, you know, any power we don't use gets stored in the, in the batteries. And then once that's done, Honestly, we kind of, because the system's a little large and we've reduced our energy consumption, we likely just lose a lot of energy produced by the by the by the panels every day. It's just lost to heat. They get dissipated as heat since we don't have a grid to send it to or a much larger battery storage system. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, do uh, a question here. Uh, do microgrids need personal operating the grid, or can they operate autonomously? So, I, I, some some individuals have already addressed that. Uh, perhaps Jana, maybe you can talk about your microgrid and the, and the personnel needs. Hi everyone. So, um, our system doesn't need to be monitored 24/7, um, but it is a great question because I think that the capacity that the tribe and or the tribe partners have to um, to monitor a, a system will drive how complex your microgrid is uh, and and so um, we have ours the, the settings and some of the design such that we don't have to monitor it 24 7 the idea is that um, we check in on it on a daily basis, but we don't have to have a, a, a person sitting there watching screens all the time. Thanks, Jana. Um, yeah, and, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Hughes microgrid will will have the diesel power plant operators and, and Agua Caliente one is, is, is autonomous as we've heard. So it just depends on the, the situation for sure. Um, next question here, uh, can a microgrid system be designed to be scalable such uh, to expand into a utility scale system? So that, I guess that's kind of a question on, on how big can they go and are they still called a microgrid and that sort of thing. But Bob, maybe you can uh, jump in on, on that one, um, uh, scalability. Sure. Um, so there's been a lot of interest and in research lately in the idea of scalability. Um, and one of the things that they're looking at is 
uh, can you make a fairly small system, like maybe just one for a building that has a little bit of smarts to it, so maybe it's got some energy storage and PV, and the building next to it has one, and the building next to that has one, and can you kind of pull all those together to make a bigger, smarter system? Um, there, there's a lot of ideas and concepts right now. Uh, for the most part, I would say um, they are getting bigger and bigger. We're seeing bigger and bigger um, facilities that are that are able to island, uh, and the systems are getting bigger. Um, and I think at that at some point it will become a little bit gray. Uh, between the grid and a microgrid, because uh, there's a point at which it's probably more of a grid than a microgrid. Um, but I, part of the future as well is the idea of network microgrids and having a lot of microgrids that are working together. Great. Thanks, Bob. Uh, just burning through the questions here. Um, uh, two for Jana. Do, do you have net metering um, and uh, what manufacturer of lithium ion was used? Hi, so uh, we do not have net metering um, on our microgrids um, because we use all of the, uh, in business as usual, when we're grid connected, we actually use all of the power on site. So the generation portion is not large enough to, to really export. Um, the, the technology that we've used and, and we've um, had, we now have three systems is the Tesla. Uh, power pack systems. And um, so we have, as was shown in the slides, um, uh, basically one megawatt, um, kil one megawatt, two kilowatt hour system um, as a part of our community scale microgrid. And then we have a 109 kilowatt, 169 kilowatt hour system as a part of our facility scale microgrid. Great. Thanks, Jenna. A um, couple of questions here uh, focused on Alaska. Um, are any Alaskan communities considering using electricity generated by nuclear powered micro reactors? And, uh, you know, obviously uh, you may not be an expert on, uh, on this, uh, Dave, but what's your, what's your uh, awareness of that? Not in my experience. There's a lot of challenges that come from nuclear reactors. The kind of myth of the small-scale uh, suitcase nuclear reactor has been talked about for the last, oh, I don't know, probably 50, 60 years, and it's always 10 years away. There's so many restrictions dealing with nuclear in this country that I don't personally think that it's practical, and there's not many communities that are interested in it. Though so there, there was some interest from the community of Galena for a while. They had a uh, military base in their community at that point, but other than that, nothing really in, in rural communities. Um, though there is kind of an uptick of interest lately as we talk about the benefits of nuclear with regards to reductions in carbon output, um, but that's in uh, larger areas on the rail belt in Alaska, not in rural communities. Um, this Thanks, is Jana. Um, I'd like to just add to Dave's comments um, and, and underscore them. Um, Humboldt Bay, uh, about 20 miles away from the tribe, um, was the site of the first privately owned nuclear power plant. It's small. Um, it was small in scale. It's not operating now. Um, but now it is a nuclear re waste repository. It is um, located, of course, where most of these are, right on the bay. It is in the direct path of sea level rise. Um, and, and this waste repository is something that there is no plan for removing the waste. Uh, there is only a a couple more decades on the current plan to store it before we're going to need to come up with a new plan. Um, and so we just we just absolutely don't think that nuclear um, on a smaller scale makes sense. It creates significant burdens for communities. Um, it costs this one costs 33 million to build in the 60s. Um, it's cost to date 1.02 billion to um, to deal with. So it, it, it's just not cost effective and it's not reliable and doesn't improve resilience. Thanks, Jana, um, for your, your insights there and on the local the local scene. Um, uh, another question, and this is a general question, so I guess uh, maybe we'll um, start with, with Bob on it, if, if you have thoughts, but Bob, but any, is there any specific regulatory issues that are preventing 
current or future microgrid planning and, and deployment? So maybe what are the regulatory challenges? Um, so there's always regulatory challenges, um, and it depends on the state that you're in. It depends on the utility that you're connected to. Um, I would say most of them can be worked around, um, and there's, uh, in any microgrid project, there's a lot of communication with the utility or the co-op or whatever uh, the power and the connection comes from to figure out kind of what are the limitations that uh, you can do or can't do. Uh, it might come in the form of, a minimum amount of power that you have to assume at all times. Um, sometimes you can't do net metering, you're not allowed to export. Um, sometimes it's uh, run times on the generators if there's emission issues. Um, but yeah, there's, there's always regulatory challenges um, and, and they're very different depending on kind of the location and the utility. Thanks, Bob. Uh, a follow-on question there specific to Janet, it says, um, uh, the CPUC has a prohibition on microgrids uh, in Section 216, um, uh, and only public utilities can own them. Are, are you familiar with that? And, and here, there in California, and how did um, you get around that if, if, if it's applicable? Um, it's a good question. I actually don't have an answer for it. We obviously own and operate a microgrid, um, <laughs> so. So we may, in fact, be um, uh, out of sync with Section 216. Um, I'll have to look that up. The bottom line is, and this kind of harkens back to the last question, too, is that, is that whether microgrids exist on the utility side or behind the, the meter on the on a individual customer side, um, I think we need to get a lot more sophisticated really quickly about um, gelling uh, microgrids into a larger grid ecosystem for all the benefits that that both systems can um, can achieve if if that gets you know in closer collaboration. So I'll give you an example that um, you know we're with our community microgrid we can export a little bit we can only export up to 100 kilowatts. Um, so and there's no actual um, technological reason for that. Um, the grid, the, the transmission distribution grid has plenty of capacity to handle more of an export. Um, so we need to work through, uh, I think, with the regulators and um, and the utilities and tribes. You know, how do we best develop these microgrid systems and remove some of these regulatory um, structures that that didn't contemplate microgrids at the start, but need to now. Um, and, and we should come at it through a lens of how can we um, really upgrade the entire grid in, in that work. Thanks, Jenna. Um, we're basically, we are out of time uh, for our schedule, but uh, we'll just throw one last question out there. And then those of you that asked questions and, and didn't get them answered, I'm going to try to forward them on to the applicable um, presenters and, and hopefully they'll have uh, some time to, to, to get back to you at some point. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the Hughes project, uh, how do you deal with the seasonality of, of solar there? That, that was for me, James, for the, the yeah. seasonality of solar PV and Hughes. So, so um, yeah. I mean, it's a challenge, right? Because we're we have decent solar resource on an annual basis, but obviously, right now, uh, about a week or so away from the winter solstice, we're not getting anything for solar PV. So, you know, that's another concern that a lot of people come up with. And and as I stressed, it's solar PV is not the perfect solution, but it's the best available solution after we reviewed uh, other technologies. So. We're hoping to see a 25% reduction, 20 to 25% reduction in the annual fuel use in the community of Hughes. And obviously most of that is going to come in the spring and summer. And we're not gonna see a significant change in the, uh, the winter and fall months. That said, we are hoping with the implementation of the battery that the community will be able to run their smaller generator more of the time during the fall and summer because the battery will act as, as a buffer. So we'll be able to change the settings on when generators kick on because now you're not just limited. If you're, if you're running, let's say, a, a base of uh, 80kW and you've got a 90kW generator running, the spinning reserve might not be significant enough. So you might have to put on 150kW. 
that's under the current scenario. But now that we've got a 200, I'm sorry, a 337 kWh battery that's able to put out up to 250 kW, we've got tons of spinning reserve in that battery. So although the solar PV won't be beneficial throughout the year, it will be beneficial in the spring and summer, and the battery will provide benefit and fuel savings uh, 365 days of the year. Thanks, Dave. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll wrap up uh, questions. Um, the, the final slide we have here is just a reminder for our, our, our 2020 series. Um, uh, we're firming up the details on that uh, now, and we'll share those particulars on our uh, Indian Energy website, and also send an email out to the listserv when, when, um, uh, once the details are available. If you need to sign up for, for that listserv, you can find that um, uh, the sign up on, on the main website um, web page for the Office of Indian Energy. Um, with that, thanks to uh, all of our, our panelists for today's uh, um, for, for their contributions to today's webinar. Uh, excellent material. And uh, to our audience, uh, thank you for your continued interest and, and attendance in the, in the webinar series and individual webinars. And we look forward to you joining us in future webinars. Uh, this includes uh, today's webinar. Thank you and have a good day.